And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Theodore S. Rappaport is the David Lee Ernst Weber Professor at New York University and holds faculty appointments in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department, the Cora Computer Science Department, and the New York Langone School of Medicine. He founded NYU Wireless, a multidisciplinary research center, and the Wireless Research Centers at the University of Texas, Austin, and Virginia Tech. His research has provided fundamental knowledge of wireless channels used to create the first Wi-Fi standard, the first U.S. digital TDMA and CDMA standards, the first public Wi-Fi hotspots, and more recently proved the viability of millimeter wave and sub-terahertz frequencies for 5G, 6G, and beyond. He co-founded two wireless communications companies that were sold publicly to traded firms. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, and the Wireless History Foundation Hall of Fame. So without further ado, let's find out what the future holds for 6G and beyond with Professor Theodore Rappaport. Hi, Theodore. You can take it away, it's all yours. Thank you, Christina. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the Millimeter Wave Coalition for having me. <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, slides now. And hopefully you can see both uh, the slides and also uh, can see me. Um, and um, just to do a quick check, Christina, and maybe Kim, if she's listening, are you able to um, see the slides? And is my video coming out okay? Indeed, yes, sir, that is correct. I see both the slides and your video feed. Okay, great. Well, thanks again. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, today, I promised to uh, present uh, the results of decades of research into millimeter wave of sub terahertz. And I've promised to give you some results, some surprises, and a glimpse of what I think the future holds for 6G and beyond. <clears throat> If you look at the wireless uh, industry and the cellular and Wi-Fi industry, we've always been operating kind of around these frequencies, microwave and uh, up to millimeter wave for 5G. And um, really uh, the idea of going to terahertz and up where the frequencies are so high that the wavelength becomes less than a, a millimeter wave, you know, smaller than a human freckle, it's a pretty new idea. <clears throat> And going up to these frequencies, uh, while we get huge amounts of bandwidth and huge amounts of gain in an antenna for a given physical size, the fact is we really don't know very much about <clears throat> these frequencies. They're really good. And so while the world is figuring out about millimeter wave, you know, I'm kind of wondering about the biological health effects, what happens as we start to move within three orders of magnitude of ionizing radiation. Here's where ionizing radiation happens going to the right. You've got um, uh, where the wavelengths are so small and the energy per particle is so high that can actually break um, uh, bonds in the valence shell uh, of, of atoms. But we're still three, four orders of magnitude uh, below that in the sub terahertz regime. But I think it is an important area to consider. I'm going to talk about that at the very end. <clears throat> but first, let let me um, just kind of go over uh, some of the results in summary. I thought these were maybe some useful results. You know, I could pick more, but I thought first of all of these four headlines <clears throat> that I found over the last 25 or so years working in millimeter wave is that millimeter wave and sub terahertz are very viable for mobile communications, not just fixed not just point to multi-point, but true mobility. And we're already seeing that in 5G with millimeter wave rollouts. Secondly, uh, there is a standard approach to modeling received power, that is path loss, over all frequencies. This was a result we came up with over many years. I'll show you the backstory on that. Third, there is a unified theory for studying power consumption and energy efficiency which is going to become more and more important with the pervasiveness of wireless and the move to higher and higher frequencies and greater bandwidths. And fourth, there are future applications that I hope to show today and motivate that will exploit the massive bandwidths and the huge 
uh, huge bandwidths and huge gains in the narrow beam widths of antennas. <clears throat> Here are some surprises that I'll show you of how we came about, my students and I, uh, interacting with our industrial affiliates who support our work over the years and also with colleagues throughout academia and industry. These are five surprises that I thought this audience would be interested in. First surprise that I'll show is multipath, that is energy coming from different directions and different delays in time, is very plentiful and it will be exploited by millimeter wave and sub terahertz. The second surprise is broadband systems are more energy efficient than narrow band systems. You get huge power efficiencies in energy per bit as we get more and more broadband. And the theory we developed will show that. The third thing that was uh, really a surprise over my career is that while there are distinct differences that I'll highlight, the mobile radio channel is remarkably similar from UHF all the way up to sub terahertz. Fourthly, the vast spectrum above 100 gigahertz, I believe, will be used, will be shared by many applications, and will be the future of 6G and 7G and Wi-Fi and beyond. And fifthly, research my students have been doing show that using some site-specific knowledge in the handset or in a mobile device or car can give remarkably accurate position location as we move up to these millimeter wave and sub terahertz frequencies. So first I thought I'd take you on the journey of how I found these results and also um, <clears throat> the surprises we encountered, my students and I encountered these surprises. Uh, going back to, I think it was 1997 or 1998, um, I can't remember which, I was doing research for uh, Hughes Research Labs and we were under a military contract to look at the viability of point to point and point to multipoint. Back in the late 1990s before the dot com bust, there was a great deal of excitement in LMDS, Local Multipoint Distribution Systems. Reed Hunt, as chairman of the FCC and the FCC commissioners, had opened up the uh, telecom uh, market to try to allow local exchange carriers to have access over wireless to compete in the wired telephone business. It was really an innovative idea. And in the late 1990s, companies made huge investments <clears throat> And I read and studied and uh, watched the industry move. It was quite a surprise to see well-known CEOs like Alex Mandel leave AT&T, the biggest telecom carrier in the country, uh, to go to a tiny startup called Telligent, which had raised uh, money basically through debt and stock. Of course, all this collapsed in the dot-com bust in 2001. Companies like Telligent and Nitro, who were making products to try to handle point to multipoint, building to building, last mile telephone. Uh, the bottom line is the semiconductor industry wasn't ready. <clears throat> but we were doing this research. And one of the amazing things I noticed in that none of that research that was done back in the 90s <clears throat> was considering mobile. In fact, all the empirical work and all the modeling work was really looking at going to tall base stations and looking at um, uh, point to multi-point rather than the mobile channel. And when I was conducting research at Virginia Tech at 38 gigahertz over 600 link, meter link for the military, I noticed something remarkable. I noticed that there was multi-path that would change as a function of rain. And I was even able to make a non-line of sight connection uh, of course, this paper we published back in 2000, we had done the work a couple years earlier. But what was interesting is you could see that rain and hail had huge impact. You see here the signal level, these uh, black uh, squares really dips as the rain and the hail amount uh, increased. So, uh, but the fact that the multipath changed as a function of rain rate was quite interesting to me. It actually piqued my curiosity. In fact, um, a little bit later, a year later, back I think 1999, uh, I started to look at 60 gigahertz channels. Uh, the FCC had just opened up these bands uh, a couple of years earlier, and uh, we started to study multipath and energy received throughout uh, the in-building environment, and saw that there were a large number of different spaces 
uh, different uh, locations that you could have um, multipath. In fact, um, if you look here, the uh, when you had the transmitter at a particular location, we could go to all these different locations and see a wide range of uh, angle of arrivals for this energy at 60 gigahertz. And we used a rotating a horn antenna on a very, very uh, <clears throat> highly calibrated linear track. And we're able to figure out that, gee, this channel is very, very diverse. Uh, we're able to see a lot of different energy coming from many different locations. And um, this, of course, uh, sparked my interest and in those of my students. And we spent many, many years studying the mobile radio channel in urban and indoor environments up above these uh, frequencies previously thought uh, non-viable, up above 10 gigahertz. So I had looked at 38, I had looked at 60 gigahertz at UT Austin, a uh, number of students, uh, really great students. We decided to take a look at uh, what would happen in an urban environment for mobile. I, we conducted this work in 2011, it appeared in this paper in 2013. And one of the really interesting things about the work is, on the Uni University of Texas campus, we could see at a bunch of different locations, many non-line of sight locations, we could actually receive energy. So the transmitter was located here on top of the building. We could go behind buildings, we could receive energy. We went to many different locations on campus and kept seeing the same thing. <clears throat> this was very exciting, showing that if we could make small adaptive arrays in the handset, and if we could um, work on doing site-specific deployment where we knew where key buildings and foliage were, uh, mobile radio looked quite viable. Now, one of the interesting things in this paper that we published in the Antennas and Propagation Society is uh, we were using a close-in free space reference distance to try to uh, standardize all of our measurements uh, in a way that could be repeatable at different locations, different transmitter uh, environments, different receiver environments. And we use this very common path loss model, which Harold Fries developed for free space. And we used a path loss exponent N. This path loss exponent is the basically the rate of decay over distance, um, given if there's a common slope over the range of distances. And this five meter selection was really arbitrary. We knew that energy goes from the near field to the far field uh, over a very small distance, certainly within a meter or two. And so we were trying to figure out how to show this energy. And then when we came to New York City uh, and I started NYU Wireless, we of course uh, conducted more work uh, in the streets of Manhattan, which confirmed indeed you can go around corners, you can have great bandwidths, and really the signal level is remarkably good, uh, very comparable to sub six gigahertz. Uh, we were wrestling with how to characterize these path loss values because everywhere we went and we present these results, people thought, first of all, we were crazy. They didn't think millimeter wave could ever work for mobile. How could you go around buildings? Uh, you know, is there really that much diversity and reflections in the channel? How are we going to build antennas? And the second thing is, I would see some of the very early work in Europe, and the very work in Europe and in Asia was using path loss models that, as a radio propagation researcher, didn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, it, it, they were using this, what we call an alpha, beta, gamma model. It's what the 3GPP global standard body had been using, I guess, since the year 2000, back when 3G was popular. And this model used to measure the signal level at a distance was being adopted and used by universities, by companies. And the thing that troubled me about the ABG model is that it had no physical basis to how the energy leaves a transmitter and goes to a receiver. No physical basis at all. They were just fits to data, parameter fits to a bunch of data made in the channel. And in fact, a colleague of mine from my very early career, Daniel devasser Batham, used to say, the funny thing about radio propagation is you show me any point, I can give you a counterpoint. 
That is, the channels are very, very, uh, they almost seem random. But I'm a big believer in physics and that physics governs how radio waves travel. And if you don't harness the physics in any kind of mathematical representation, um, you're, you're able to get results that don't make any sense. Now, I know artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms of today often aren't based in physics. They're often based in simple machine learning and learning patterns without a lot of basis. But the more physical basis you can put in any model, the better you're going to be in recreating the physics of an entity. And we know the physics of radio propagation. In fact, if you look, well, you'll see that um, in this next slide, um, we did the math for a model which is called the close-in, uh, the CI model. The close-in model is basically based on Harold Free's early work, but where we use an exponent, a path loss exponent n, which dictates the slope of the received signal in decibels over distance. And then we coined an idea of a, the CIF model. We thought maybe if we could keep some basic in physics, that is this free space path loss within the first meter, we decided to try a first meter or one meter free space reference distance because that got us into the far field of all these frequencies with practical antennas up above 20, 25 gigahertz. That is the physical size of an antenna is such that after a meter, you're pretty much into the far field. So once you're into the far field and you remove the far free, the near field to far field um, transition, which happens in the first meter, and if you reference every measure of power back to a first meter free space reference distance, we believed you'd have a much better basis for a physical model of received power or path loss. We coined this CIF or close-in reference distance model frequency dependent, where you still had the path loss exponent n, and you have this factor b, you had a, a b, which was a parameter for determining a weighting function of the frequency selectivity or the frequency variation of path loss. So we had these two ideas of path loss models for millimeter wave and sub terahertz, yet the industry was very much set on um, looking at uh, the, the way they had done things in the 3G world. And here's where we really figured out to try to use a D naught equal one meter or one meter free space reference distance. Not only did the CI and CIF path loss models have fewer parameters than the model being used by industry and by people around the world, but it also had really this physical uh, basis and it also allowed engineers and researchers from around the world to start comparing all of their measurements in the streets, in the cities, in the buildings, all to a common basis. And that made much more sense out of trying to um, understand the, uh, trying to understand the, uh, uh, the, uh, the results from different people. I just realized I wasn't in the uh, full screen mode, so let me do that. So we went to study with people from industry and academia in Europe at many companies that were sponsoring NYU Wireless. We looked at a massive data, uh, this massive amount of data, and compared these various models using a one meter free space reference. And the remarkable result was <clears throat> if you plotted all the data from indoor and outdoor, different frequencies, wide range of frequencies, wide range of cities, wide range of buildings, the standard deviation was just a tad bit higher uh, in the, uh, with the CI and CIF model. It's just a little bit higher, 5.7 versus 5.3. But the amazing thing is, is that the CI and the CI model uh, both uh, were very comparable. This B, this frequency, weighting factor was very close to zero. So it turned out that there wasn't a lot of frequency dependence all the way from 10 to 28 to 38 gigahertz. We also found the same thing going all the way up to um, 73 gigahertz. And when we looked at all the data to try to figure out a sensitivity analysis 
And if you omitted some measurements and had some measurements, if some measurements were blocked by a building and others weren't blocked by a building in the city, what we found is that the industry had been using an ABG model, which had a lot of variation, huge standard deviation in a data set if you missed a few data points, where you had very smooth and very reliable uh, performance if you took out various data points from the CI and to a lesser extent, the CIF model. In fact, when you looked at the alpha, beta, and gamma parameters, compared it to the CI and the CIF models, the propagation path loss models that were steeped in physics, going from the near field to far field, using freeze equation in the first meter, you had so much more reliability over arbitrary data sets. And this proved to me and to the world that using a first meter free space reference distance going up to these very high frequencies makes so much more sense. Not only can you interpret them <clears throat> between different research groups and standard bodies, but furthermore, the particular data sets contributed by different standard bodies will have much, much less sensitivity to the measurements you did or didn't make. This was a landmark paper and it won an award that year. Now, along the way, one of the things we wondered, and I had a wonderful grad student, James Murdoch, uh, who he, he really pondered this idea of how do we measure power efficiency, especially as we go up to these super high frequencies and super high bandwidths. <clears throat> How can we develop a theory that can be used in general for determining how to design wireless transmitters, receivers, and wireless networks? And we had talked about this and realized one of the great contributions of Bell Labs that we teach in every digital communications course is the theory of noise figure. Noise figure is a analytical, mathematical approach to quantifying and comparing any circuit, any system for its performance in the face of noise. Noise is this random event, yet if we have noise, we can design to signal to noise ratio to engineer a proper wireless link. So we have to characterize noise in our circuits and in our cascaded systems. James and I set out to try to figure, could we develop a similar theory for con the consumption of power? It's interesting, I was on a panel just a week or two ago at the Brooklyn 6G Summit, which was pretty amazing content. You could see it. It's open to the public at IEEE TV. The Brooklyn 6G Summit, there were a number of us researchers looking at the future of 6G and beyond. And uh, I was on a panel session with the Dean of Princeton, a colleague of mine, Andrea Goldsmith, where um, she said that it's so hard to quantify power consumption. And I, um, I argued back, well, Andrew, I don't think you've seen our consumption factor theory. This theory really was modeled after the noise figure theory, where if you take a device, uh, say a particular uh, baseband uh, system with a mixer and an oscillator and a power amplifier, and you take something like this, how can we develop a formal way of characterizing What's the best design? How much power efficiency do I need in the power amplifier versus the load versus the phased array antenna? What if I lose power in my phased array? How power efficient does my mixer have to be? We set out to answer these kinds of questions. And the uh, we, we even had in mind back in 2011 when we were working on this, uh, we had in mind that someday there would be these huge massive broadband networks. So just like in noise figure theory, if you have a source and you have a sink and you have various signal path uh, uh, devices, we set out to figure out how much power is consumed by a device that transmit bits through the channel and how much of that device's power is not being used to transmit bits through the channel. That is for each ounce of energy, each joule of energy, how much is being wasted in heat or in performing uh, off, uh, off signal path uh, jobs, and how much is actually being put into the transmission. In fact, if you look at equation 21 in this paper, we broke up the consumed power into three components. 
the signal power, which is made available to the signal that's going to eventually be radiated or carried down a cable or a fiber optic cable or a circuit or a cascaded system. This was totally um, applicable to wireless, wired devices, circuits, systems. It's very general. How much power is being uh, consumed by that device to carry the signal to the next stage? How much power is being used by that device to carry uh, the signal to the next stage, but is not being used to generate the signal itself? In other words, wasted in heat. And then how much of that power is being used by that component uh, where it has nothing to do with carrying the signal, but maybe it's a power supply or maybe it's a, a graphical user interface or something having nothing to do with carrying the signal uh, through the communications channel. When you break up every bit of power into these three different uh, separate bins, what you find out is fascinating. And that's what we did in the consumption factor theory. What you find out is that you can now identify the optimal signal to noise ratio or the optimal amount of power consumption for a given signal to noise signal to noise ratio in order to maximize your use of energy. I won't go into the details here, but the bottom line is we now have a way to adjust the power efficiency and consume power and the way to compare different devices as a function of uh, the particular cascade of components, the particular radio channel. In fact, we have this power efficiency factor H which is really very much like freeze noise figure. In fact, if you look at the definition of H and this cascaded summation to the minus one, H to the minus one is really just like the noise factor in freeze noise figure uh, theory. So the bottom line here is we have developed a very similar approach to quantifying the power of any network, any device, any wireless link. And once you do that, you can start determining where it makes sense to be power efficient and where not to be power efficient. For example, uh, in figure six in this work, we found out that a high signal path efficiency, that is with very, very good uh, components that are very, very low loss and with very, very high non-path power, that is, think of a smartphone. This smartphone spends most of its power not in transmitting and receiving radio energy, but in the graphical user interface, the display, the processor. So, so really, we have a lot of non-path, P sub NP in, in these equations is power and the non-path. We do so much non-path processing in smart devices. What we can see is, that the energy expenditure is dominated by non-path power, which means there's little advantage, to, little advantage to shortening the transmission distances. Yet, if we figure out, uh, if we're able to figure out that things are very non-efficient, where the H is uh, very small, 0.001 for the uh, uh, efficiency, it turns out that it becomes very advantageous to use smaller distances uh, to maximize your power consumption. We went on to figure out the optimal distance where you get maximum consumption factor for relays versus non-relays. But this was a theory that we developed over a decade ago that is just now starting to find use in the design of millimeter wave systems, smart antennas, massive MIMO. It's very early days, but this is something we think really offers the opportunity to analyze these shorter link distances, these massive bandwidths, which we're gonna see. And we actually used this recently in studying a high altitude platform system uh, with Nokia, where you look at having a, basically a repeater or a base station fly on a drone uh, several kilometers above earth. Uh, you could use this for emergency deployment of cell sites and so on. But um, anyway, so that's kind of a look at some of the results and some of the surprises that we found. Um, and now I thought I'd give a glimpse at what the future of wireless is likely to be building on the foundation of the move of the wireless industry to 5G and uh, the millimeter wave uh, 
adoption in Wi-Fi that's starting to happen. Um, you know, the FCC opened up the spectrum from 95 gigahertz to three terahertz back in uh, 2019. And there are now four bands, four uh, unlicensed bands. Products are being developed, uh, applications are being made. And uh, this, is, this has happened around the world. Uh, England's also done this. And, and what you have when you bring these frequencies above 100 gigahertz into the four is these huge channels and these huge bandwidths with now, which now allow these new kinds of applications we never had in wireless. Uh, for example, we have um, uh, the idea of a human surrogate. Ray Ozzy and I talked about this at the Brooklyn 6G Summit uh, just earlier this month. The idea of having near human brain data rates, uh, the rate of our computation in, in our brain, uh, which is several thousand terabits uh, per second. That's how fast we're computing with the huge parallel processing in our brain. You know, the idea of having wireless devices actually doing uh, some mundane tasks for us at the rate of our thought. And robotic control, uh, fleet control. Uh, these are some of the applications when you get to these huge bandwidths. Sensing, of course, uh, you can start doing spectroscopy over these wide range of frequencies, uh, gesturing and detection, touchless smartphones. Some of these are already coming, detecting the air. Uh, see in the dark, we'll be able to do imaging. Uh, very exciting application as you get to these very high bandwidths and very narrow beam widths. And then, of course, communication. The information shower is something I've been talking about <clears throat> for 15 years or so. And we'll actually be able to have huge data rates, download information as we pass by an access point as we drive along in our car. And then positioning, which I'll talk about a little later, you get remarkable positioning as you get this high resolution, both temporally with a much wider bandwidth and also spatially with much more narrow band antennas. So some of the ideas here, uh, drones delivering autonomous cars, robotics, holographics, uh, offloading, cloud compute. Uh, that's very exciting. A lot of work's going into that. Uh, detection, uh, simultaneous localization and mapping, SLAM, where you can map out where you are, map out your environment and send it back to the edge uh, for computing and building up of maps, instant real-time sensing, knowing what's happening in the environment. And of course, in mobile communications, getting to these huge uh, backhaul, uh, I believe it's a huge opportunity for solving the digital divide, connecting the next billion, rural connectivity with these huge bandwidths, it becomes like wireless fiber. And as I'll show, the weather and the oxygen uh, absorption is really a myth. So that's one of the surprises uh, that I mentioned early. Chip to chip communication will even be viable. So uh, these, these kinds of things happen when you open up the uh, bandwidth. And let me just quickly show you the human brain and uh, how powerful it is. Uh, you know, we have about 100 billion neurons. Uh, each neuron's connected to about 1,000 others. Each of them fire at five milliseconds, but they're all firing asynchronously. Uh, so we have all this massive connectivity, 100 billion neurons. Uh, that leads to 20,000 terabits per second. That's how fast each of our minds are computing. And each neuron, if it has binary right access to the other 1,000 neurons, that's a 1, 000, uh, 100 terabyte hard drive in our brain. So 100 terabytes, 20,000 terabits per second, each of us walking around doing that parallel processing in real time. And $1,000 is gonna buy that computation in uh, about 15 years. So in 15 years, we'll have $1,000 computational capability in our smartphone or whatever it'll be called then. And can we do this wirelessly? Can we transmit that kind of data? And, you know, I believe we will. Look at, if we use 10 gigahertz RF channels and 1024 QAM, which of course will exceed, I believe by then, uh, certainly more efficient modulations. And you figure we get beyond today's massive MIMO and we somehow get a thousand times uh, what is a, a baseline. We're at about 10 to 15 times now. Uh, say we go another factor of 60 in 15 years, then we can have a physical layer, a true transmission of data at 100 terabytes per second. That's one two hundredth of the human brain real-time processing speed. And if we had 100 gigahertz bandwidth channels, 
we could do one petabyte per second, which is 5% of the human brain. Now, 100 gigahertz RF channels may sound really way out there, but in some of the whisper radio bands, in some of the spectrum getting up to uh, several terahertz, it might be possible. So the bottom line is there may be other discoveries that happen with research around the world. And I told you there's a myth about the oxygen absorption. You know, most of the wireless industry has lived its life down here below six gigahertz, where the attenuation in standard sea level is uh, less than a tenth of a dB per kilometer. So there's really been no oxygen absorption at all in the sub six gigahertz world. But look at this, if you go out even as far out to 400 gigahertz, you only have due to oxygen 10 dB per kilometer. 10 dB per kilometer is only 100 meters, is only one dB per 100 meters. So you only have one dB attenuation in small cells all the way up to 400 gigahertz. Now, it's not a fraction of a dB, but one dB is very small. So this myth that oxygen causes this terrible loss to mobile as we get up to millimeter wave is simply not true uh, in standard atmosphere, standard air. I mean, there are these bands, look at this at 60 gigahertz. This is why the FCC opened it up back in the 1990s. This is why we opened up the 60 gigahertz Wi-Fi band, IEEE 802.11 AD, because there's natural attenuation up to about 20 dB per kilometer. There are these other bands, which I call whisper bands. Look at this at about 120. You get some natural attenuation here. That's why the FCC's opened up that band in its recent uh, move above 100 uh, gigahertz. And sure enough, you have up at 183 gigahertz, you have these whisper bands. I call them whisper radio bands. I've called them that for about 15 years because you can basically whisper. The radio waves don't travel very far. It's like whispering and no one else hears you. You have these big bands up at 550, 450, 380. These are whisper radio, but by and large, most of the spectrum is only one dB per 100 meters. That's really great news for the future of wireless, and it kind of debunks the whole idea that you've got um, problems due to air. Let's go out to 900 gigahertz and look at 900 gigahertz. 900 gigahertz is, is maybe 100 dB per kilometer. 100 dB per kilometer, that's tremendous loss, but that's only 10 dB per 100 meter cell. Only 10 dB. The bottom line is going all the way out to 900 gigahertz means we're only going to have about uh, 10 dB loss if we can get out to uh, 900 gigahertz with the densification that's happening today in the small cell movement. So as small cells move out to um, move out to deploy and we get smaller and smaller base station coverage, we really have the opportunity to go uh, way up in frequency. So let me get back to where I was. Um, I'm using this annotation feature for the first time. It's kind of fun. So uh, this should debunk one of the myths that the air is creating a problem for us. Now, rain does create a problem. Rain does create a problem as we, uh, again, the sub six gigahertz world always looked at um, you know, below six gigahertz, we really didn't have any issues with rain. Even when rain got very, very heavy, 150 millimeters per hour, we had a fraction of a dB attenuation in rain. And as you get up to uh, millimeter wave frequencies, we can see that indeed you get 20 dB uh, per kilometer, uh, for 20 dB per kilometer for rain. But once you design your cells at 5G, up around 50 gigahertz is we design the cells for weather at 50 gigahertz everything to the right flat tops that is once you design your small cells for 50 gigahertz or so the effects of rain really don't come into play beyond that so the rain attenuation you have at 50 or so is about the same going all the way up to a terahertz up to 900 gigahertz when you put that all together what you see is we're going to be able to get backhaul uh, fixed point rural fiber replacement out to several kilometers, even with rain, with very adaptive, very fixed adaptive antennas. And for mobile, certainly a couple hundred meters all the way up to several hundred gigahertz looks viable.
There doesn't look like to be any physics stopping. Now, the whole world right now, or most of the world, probably a lot of you on this uh, call in the Millimeter Wave Coalition know this, but the larger audience probably doesn't. If you look to the right, this shows what most people believe today in the cellular industry, that as you go higher in frequency, you get more path loss. You can see here the 140 gigahertz curve is higher in path loss for a uh, given uh, distance than the lower frequencies. Again, this is for removing antenna gains. This is just with the omnidirectional antennas on both ends of the length. However, if you keep the physical area or the effective area the same at both the transmitter and receiver, what you see is going up to higher frequencies gives you stronger power, not weaker, less path loss. In fact, you can see here the 73 gigahertz is in the middle, 28 is green, it's uh, it's, it's got the higher received power when you have omnidirectional antennas, but it's the 140 gigahertz antenna system. It's the 140 gigahertz system that has the most received power for given physical area. Now it's true, partition losses, penetration losses, foliage losses are greater as we go higher in frequency. But here's the remarkable thing about moving up to millimeter wave and terahertz as we get more directional antennas in the same physical area. Here is basic path loss math from Free's free space equation. And what you can see is when you use directional antennas at both ends of the length, the same physical area, you keep the physical area the same, we go to higher frequencies, and equation three here shows you that for a given distance, that is if you fix distance, your received power increases by the square of frequency. This is for fixed size antennas over frequency. That is the gain gets greater as you go higher in frequency in the same physical area. This key factor means that as we go higher in frequency, we're gonna get much more power, not much less power. That's very exciting. And just to show you an example of uh, how that works, some simple numbers looking from three to 300 gigahertz for a particular area that you'd have in a handset, particular area that you'd have in a small base station panel. These are typical values used today. You see that going from three to 300 gigahertz will give you 40 dB more signal to noise ratio. 40 dB more received power for given antennas. That's not magic. It's just basically capturing more energy with the uh, directional antenna. So this debunks the myth, combine that with the fact you don't lose much power in air. Uh, you've got a line of sight channel, you're gonna do great. Even in non-line of sight, you get this huge gain by using directional antennas. This is big news because what it means is we're gonna be able to uh, design wireless networks way out into the future where we're gonna get much greater bandwidths. That is, we'll be able to use this additional power to get much greater bandwidth channels at no loss of battery power. So you combine the consumption factor power theory to make the design of the devices proper, figure out the siting for maximum power efficiency to make the consumption factor optimal. You take advantage of the fact that there's really not that much loss in the channel up to 400 gigahertz we're gonna be able to get much greater signal to noise ratio and use that to get much greater bandwidth. So the upshot of some of our work going up to sub terahertz is that the frequency bands are, uh, you know, we have these whisper radio bands where you can do very close in, very uh, wire replacement, rapid attenuation. And then you have these uh, bands that'll be great for mobile. Now, we've done a lot of work on campus, in the building, in the lab, and the NYU wireless industrial affiliates get instant access to this research. It typically takes a couple of years to come out in publications. We try to get the work out as fast as we can, but you know the work is ongoing. We're constantly measuring. We're in factories this week, measuring a bunch of factories around Brooklyn for the 140 gigahertz indoor channel. But the students have really done a great deal of work. I can't say enough about my graduate students. They're just terrific. And a lot of their papers are cited here. But we've made measurements at the same locations as often as we could over the last decade at 28, 73, 
and 142 gigahertz outdoor and indoor. And here's the remarkable thing we found. When you use, the, use that one meter free space path loss, indeed, the channel path loss is very, very similar. We get very similar path loss exponents um, going all the way up to uh, 142 gigahertz. Uh, the CIF model works a little bit better than the uh, uh, CI model indoors, but still the CI model, the close-in model, really uh, works very well from 28 all the way to 142 gigahertz. You can see the path loss exponents are the same in the CIF and CI model. Uh, the B value of 0.3 is not quite zero, but it's close to zero, uh, but you get a much better standard deviation when you use the uh, CIF model. Uh, in fact, the CIF model works better in non-line of sight uh, than it did in line of sight. In non-line of sight, the CIF and CI model are very similar, showing the, the path loss exponent after the first meter of free space. This is the value of using the one meter free space reference distance. Anyone anywhere in the world now can publish their data and they have meaningful parameters. B is a frequency weighting factor and N is the path loss exponent. Two parameters. Uh, anyone else could publish these data. In the alpha, beta, gamma model, you have alpha, beta, and gamma, which we showed can run all over the place. There's no real physical meaning there, except maybe for beta, you could argue is kind of close to path loss. But the bottom line is this was a really surprising result that going all the way out to 142, uh, we have a very similar path loss back at 28. And by the way, that's very similar to sub six gigahertz, which goes to show one of the big surprises. These channels don't vary very much over um, different uh, frequencies all the way from sub six out to uh, 140 gigahertz. You lose some uh, spatial diversity going higher in frequencies. These are the number of clusters, different spatial clusters, and the multipath delay spread decreases as you go higher in frequency in an office environment. So you get less scattering, less reflection, more obstruction, but still there's a lot of diversity. Uh, we've put all this into NYU SIM and published these indoor channel models up to 140. NYU SIM is a public domain, free software you can access off the NYU wireless webpage, which generates all these measurements and channel impulse responses and angle of arrival, angle of departure, so you don't have to do the measurements we've done. And uh, when you look at outdoor, you get a similar result uh, where there's a large number of spatial clusters at 142 gigahertz. Very exciting results that have come in where we're able to see there's a lot of multipath and mobile links will work. And we went all around the campus at Brooklyn, even during COVID with the transmitter and receiver at different locations, measured a lot of the locations we did, the same ones at 73 and a lot of 28. And again, we found the same thing over these wide range of frequencies. The CI, the close in reference distance model gives us a very similar path loss exponent, 2.96 after the first meter of free space. It's virtually frequency independent all the way to sub terahertz in the outdoor urban microcell environment. And you can see many different spatial uh, uh, energy uh, angles of arrival clusters. And again, you see them drop somewhat, but not too much in non-line of sight. Look at the angle of arrival in non-line of sight, a uh, 4.1 at 142 gigahertz versus 4.7. This is the average number of unique spatial directions you can see in the outdoor channel. This is great news. It means we'll be able to detect energy from many different locations. Of course, the threshold on this matters. If a signal is blocked, you wanna very quickly find the beam where there is energy that's unblocked, but this shows a remarkable amount of diversity. And similar to the indoor results, uh, what you see is that uh, multipath does, uh, does decrease, uh, does decrease in general over a non-line of sight. Uh, it's interesting, we have this one directional line of sight measurement, the maximum, that was very odd. Uh, it was from a reflection that happened to be in the same location under the directional line of sight, 13.9 nanoseconds. But by and large, you have less uh, time dispersion as you go higher frequency. We've generated this in NYU SIM. We're putting the outdoor models in now, that'll be a new release. You can start doing spatial, uh, uh, single uh, spatial multiplexing versus beam forming, eigenvalue beam forming analysis with this channel data. And we're starting to do that. And a lot of our industrial affiliates are doing that. The bottom line is 
outdoor at 140 gigahertz, it's really going to work. You're not frequency dependent. Uh, looks like it's still viable. And of course, you can always use dual polarization because there's remarkably good uh, cross polarization separation between polarizations in these channels. So you can use dual polarized antennas. Now, let me say a word about uh, Earth space path loss because operating at these frequencies above 100 gigahertz, we have uh, this amazing natural barrier in the troposphere. The plot on the right shows the path loss as you uh, pierce that troposphere from Earth up to this, with these satellites up in space. We have these passive satellites. They're very important, vital for our science and weather prediction and um, vital for our world. And they operate as very, very sensitive, super low noise detectors trying to detect energy from above the troposphere, looking down on Earth into the troposphere. And if you have mobile units on the Earth, they could interfere with these very sensitive uh, weather satellites. So we have to understand, is it possible to use mobile devices on Earth and rely on this remarkable separation that's provided this, uh, this uh, protection, if you will, that's provided by the troposphere? Well, the answer is uh, you can rely on very low angles of radiation on Earth. You can rely on the troposphere to give us attenuation. These solid lines and the millimeter wave coalition has been looking at this. These solid lines show you the attenuation, the path loss. There's a thousand dB, there's 2000 dB of attenuation. You can see at different frequencies, there are these uh, places where you, the troposphere gives us great attenuation due to the oxygen absorption. And you can see these correspond to where the FCC has allocated the license free bands uh, just a couple years ago. The question is, can we put mobile here in these green areas and not interfere with, not have out of band emissions that interfere with these very sensitive uh, satellites that are up there. And these are our best guess of how many satellites are up there. And, and the question is, can we do it? And we did an experiment at NYU, and I'll finish up here because I realize I, I've got a lot more, but I realize we're running out of time. We, uh, we took a look at how you might do that. And we decided to, put a mobile a receiver up on the roof on the left and use a bunch of transmitters on the ground on the right. And could we try to, could we capture energy on this receiver on the left, uh, pretending that's a satellite and you can see it on the far right here, trying to look at every possible direction. Could we find energy that was emitted from the ground? And you can see we have a base station on the ground emulating a mobile unit or a base station. And so with the, uh, satellite surrogate mounted on the building on the left, we went to 10 different locations on the Brooklyn NYU campus to see if we could find energy from a mobile that was transmitting, radiating in all different directions systematically, and then systematically scanning all possible directions on the roof to see if we could find any energy. And this was the only place we could find scattering of energy when we were relatively high on the horizon at the transmitter and bouncing off of a building. We were about 20 dB down, getting a reflected path from the terrestrial transmitter going up to the mobile. We published a paper recently, an invited paper. This is a very busy chart, but the bottom line is that surrogate receiver up on a roof of a building is not the hundreds of kilometers away, and it doesn't have the hundreds of dB of additional path loss protection from the troposphere. But even there, you can see we still get very good isolation from that ground mounted location, meaning that if we can keep the energy on the horizon, we're gonna do very well um, in being able to avoid interference and use these mobile bands up to the subterrace. Certainly inside buildings where you have 40 dB of attenuation due to the roof, you should be able to operate indoor devices and not create inter interference to these satellites that are out uh, above, uh, out in space above the troposphere. Uh, so that's an exciting area of regulation and sharing and how to be an emission definition. Real quickly, I'll wrap up by showing some of the work we're doing at NYU Wireless now where we're trying to miniaturize the channel sounder, trying to bring the baseband and RF onto chips. We're looking at the zero energy air interface with InterDigital, one of our industrial affiliates, using the consumption factor theory to figure out the optimal design on how to build really true lowest energy devices. 
for the future of IoT. Positioning at Millimeter Wave is very, very promising. And my student, Ojas Kenheri, has looked at some amazing ideas of taking maps, putting them on the phone, putting them on the handset, doing ray tracing in real time. We're building a ray tracer and using a ray tracer on a phone. Could you actually use a map along with these narrow beams and wide bandwidth signals to uh, determine your location? We call it map AT, map assisted positioning with angle and time. And you can run this today on a standard CPU in real time. So we benchmark that certainly with Moore's law, that'll get easier to do. And what we find is with only one base station and a crude map, we're able to get within five centimeters, five and six centimeters over 35 meters in a building. This is really exciting. Uh, and, and in fact, as you go to uh, higher frequencies with more bandwidth, we believe it's gonna get better with more uh, antenna accuracy. And this is, this is the future. We believe this is the future for um, uh, getting there. Anyway, I'm at the end of the talk. I'm at the end of the time. I'll just uh, wrap up by showing uh, even outdoor, we get very good uh, position location. We get accuracy to within 30 centimeters with a single base station, a single base station, if you have some knowledge of the, of the map. And we're able to do it with drones, uh, very accurate uh, drone locations as well. Uh, I talked about RF safety. Uh, we believe right now everything we know is heating is the big worry, heating a surface. But we do need to do more work. We do need to do more work as we move above 100 gigahertz. There need to be studies. And um, we're certainly interested and want to do that work. Uh, we hope the governments around the world will start looking at, at studying this. We wrote a paper which was really important for 5G. Uh, we want to be able to do the work and get the knowledge. It's not there yet, but we need to know the knowledge of going to uh, these 100 gigahertz and above frequencies. We need to make sure they're safe. In conclusion, it looks like there's clear sailing uh, technically up to 900 gigahertz. Uh, and um, I hope you found it interesting and a big thanks to the NYU wireless industrial affiliates who support our work. I'll stop there and I know we're right at the hour, but see if there's uh, any questions. Hi there, yeah, we do have a few questions. That That's very fascinating. It's exciting to see where we're going <laughs> in terms of information and stuff. Let's see. So um, the, the first question was considering the CI, CIF models, at what point will sub terahertz technology evolve to the point that would enable musicians the ability to perform together in real time without lag or latency? Wow, that's a great question. The lag and latency between different people comes from the physical distance of energy having to travel from one point to another. So what that means is the more distance you have between individuals, there will always be a physical delay. The question is how much delay can be tolerated before it impedes our ability to interact? And that's on the order of tens of milliseconds. So as long as we can have latency that's say below uh, 10 or 20 milliseconds, we should be able to uh, perform that, uh, be able to do that easily. And uh, radio waves or energy travels uh, 100 meters per microsecond. So uh, you think about 100 meters per microsecond, you know, a thousand microseconds is a, is a millisecond. So that's uh, 100,000 meters, uh, you know, which is what I'm doing this in my head, but 100,000 meters is what a uh, uh, 100 kilometers. So if you're within 100 kilometers, we should easily be able to do a millisecond if the latency in the wireless channel is, is negligible. And the beauty of going to wider and wider bandwidths is the bit duration or symbol duration becomes much smaller to where the latency becomes small, much smaller, the packet size becomes much smaller. So technically we should, uh, when 5G reaches maturity, we will be able to do those kinds of things, human interaction without latency. In fact, I bet you can do it now, but easily, uh, as we get wider and wider bandwidths, we'll be able to have latencies well below 10 milliseconds. We're trying to shoot for 10 milliseconds now in 5G. So that will be possible. 
the, the beauty of going to much, much wider band was in addition to smaller packet sizes and polar, smaller symbol durations is that the wider bandwidth will also exploit things like sensing and position location and other things that we're gonna get for free. But the latency problem is really a physical location and a network transport uh, problem, not just over the air interface from the mobile to the base station or from your laptop to the Wi-Fi access point, but then what happens in, in the network from the access point as your bits are aggregated and sent through the core. So right now with 5G new radio, we should be able to do that without latency, without noticeability, and that will improve over the next few years. Okay. Yeah, I, I would imagine that uh, having specific networks also out there, you know, like uh, just, just segregated networks, right? For people that specifically want to do musical things, that, that would probably also help with the error correction and so forth. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it brings up an idea. Uh, you know, there's no reason why we couldn't use 5G devices for, uh, think about it, wireless microphones at the opera or a symphony or musicians that want to jam. We could do that now uh, really with the, abil with the ability that's in 5G and the channel bandwidth and the data capacity uh, that's there now. So 5G will allow that. And 5G is the first global cellular standard that is network slicing that allows factories or different constituencies to develop their own network. So you could kind of imagine a symphony or a uh, opera house or a factory or you know some kind of uh, venue or even a university that has a bunch of uh, student researchers all working collaboratively on such things in real time, all connected within a local area where transport delays are not an issue. Today's even better for young that. kids too, right? For for learning, right? So teachers they can teach kids from from distances. It doesn't even matter. I think it would be awesome. Well, look at what happened in the pandemic. Look at the value of wireless and how vital. 4G networks and Wi-Fi networks were for learning, for business. I mean, this should show that the global governments around the world, the vitality and the necessity of the information and communications technology sector. ICT was the lifeblood during the pandemic of economies and kids learning, and it doesn't replace being there, but still, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, Christina, that there are myriad applications once you get this bandwidth. And in fact, at the Brooklyn 6G Summit, we just had, check it out on IEEE TV. We talk about the digital twin human, the idea of digitizing and virtualizing. So it's like you're there with someone else, uh, more kinds of realistic interaction, even when you're remote. So um, that's kind of what the world is looking to. That's awesome, sign me up. <laughs> so um, it, we have just a few more questions, if if it's okay. Should, can, I, can I continue with just like maybe three more questions? Oh, yeah, I'm fine with it if we have time. Oh, yeah, heck yeah. Okay, so uh, let's see the next question. In the human brain, neurons that fire together, wire together, what type of device training needs to happen in the next decade to get subterahertz wireless comm to the optimum level of efficiency? That's a really hard question. I don't, I don't think anyone's looking at that. I certainly don't know the answer. It's a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating topic. I know uh, there's a lot we know and a lot we don't know about the human brain, and I'm not an expert by any means on the human brain. But uh, the CTO of IBM, a friend of mine, Paul Horn, former CTO, and I had a wonderful discussion several years ago, which motivated my thinking towards. Um, thinking about could wireless carry that kind of data rate. And, you know, it looks like we could get close to there. We'll be approaching that soon in commodity pricing, soon being the next 10, 15 years. But I don't know the answer. I think that's a fascinating field of research. Okay. Well, yeah, I think, like, I think about the Internet of Things. I mean, they do a lot of... Uh talk about things you know just like error corrections and, and things like that i guess we're just going to see as as these things evolve you know when we get faster and faster you know public real time we're in 6g and 7g I, i'm sure we'll see those breakthroughs yeah, yeah uh let's see okay the next question what is the critical challenge for the 6g development 
Okay, there are a number of critical challenges. On the device side, there's making power efficient amplifiers, power efficient circuits, power efficient phased array antennas. You know, hybrid beamforming is still the norm in the wireless industry. Analog beamforming will come, but packing the small number of antennas, a uh, small physical size of a large number of antennas and small physical side and dissipating the heat, uh, building those and making those viable is a challenge. And this is assuming above 100 gigahertz. Uh, there's spectrum allocation challenges, getting harmonized spectrum around the world to allow uh, access to a market when these uh, systems first come out above 100 gigahertz, making sure they could work in multiple countries uh, because uh, and there'll be a learning curve on the deployment of, uh, we're learning that now in millimeter wave, 5G millimeter wave, the engineering workforce is learning how to deploy. The tools are being made to properly deploy reliable 100, 200 meter cell kind of distances and backhaul. Uh, I think that's a challenge. Uh, just the, the knowledge of, the, of the, the, the workforce, understanding the propagation and understanding the proper deployment. I think um, those are the main challenges. Uh, I think they're all being worked on. If you look at uh, our 2019 paper, uh, we had a paper about 6G challenges and opportunities. We pointed out some of the global research efforts that are trying to solve these problems. We kind of enumerated them, but uh, I think that's it in a nutshell. I'm sure there are more. Okay. I think light and fiber optic would go hand in hand with the sub terahertz development then, right? Well, you're, you're going to see a lot of fiber being used to replace coax cable. A lot of RF over fiber, that's going to be the future of the infrastructure. I think it's a great use of fiber um, <clears throat> uh, more and more into the wireless world. Yeah, I've seen these guys splice fiber optic cables into, uh, for example, like in our business, in, our small, in one of our offices, uh, you know, you've got these 40 channels and you've got these little tiny strands and one strand has like 144 channels and you know we're only using like 20 of them <laughs> so right. that's just one strand so it's going to be yeah uh, and we've got the infrastructure going so it's exciting very exciting um so looks like i got one more question here uh what besides heat might terahertz rf exposure can be a concern well i'm i'm eager to find out. We need to know that answer. Um, sometimes you can get vibrations of cell. So if you look at our uh, Safe for Generations to Come paper, we found a few reports in the literature when you get up to high um, millimeter wave frequencies up, uh, I think, around 80 or 90 gigahertz. There were some observations of cells, cells that would vibrate uh, and the question is, can vibration create damage? I think uh, these were on very, very intense power levels. Nevertheless, since energy goes up as a uh, uh, frequency goes up in a particle, the question is, will lower power but higher frequency create vibrations? And do vibrations lead to cell damage? Can cell damage lead to uh, uh, mutations? I think how things vibrate and if there's damage uh, is, is the key, is one of the things we need to understand. The other thing is we just need to understand um, things we don't know about. That's why, uh, you know, it's, it's, we need to learn more about what radiated energy at these frequencies do to living organisms. There was a fascinating panel at the, uh, this year's, this summer's, International Microwave Symposium, IMS. Uh, my colleague, Chris Collins in the med school, he and I worked together on some of these health effects in the past. He was joined by several other people kind of exploring this, what was known to date. And everything known to date, you know, when all the 5G um, concerns, people are concerned about 5G millimeter wave uh, health effects. And there's, you know, th there's nothing there that we could find. And the panel confirmed that. Uh, so there was, you know, yeah, I mean, but there were other points of view that that brought in, you know, fears and concerns. And I think the more the research complex can can get some good objective people working on that to study the issue, uh, 
the sooner the better because technology wise we'll be able to go in commodity pricing up to terahertz uh, up to sub terahertz probably in the next seven to ten years so it'd be good to really start researching this now absolutely all right well um i don't see any other questions coming in the chat window i guess we can go ahead and, and end it here um so let me let me just give a shout out to my current grad students i've, I've been blessed with so many great grad students but i want to give a big shout out to yan xiaoxing and to ojis kenheri and to xi xiaoju and to Dapankar shakya and to uh uh hitesh potter who's joined me recently uh just really terrific grad students doing an amazing amount of work and uh and also to Jashe, who's helping Ojis. Um, these students work so hard and are really uh, inspiring to me and hopefully their work and the work of my past students has inspired people. Absolutely, thank you. I guess we'll go ahead and end it here. Uh, on behalf of Washington Labs Academy, I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance. I'm gonna go ahead and end the event. Please enjoy the rest of your day and most importantly, be safe out there. So until next time, bye-bye, everybody.